Hi, everyone, and welcome to Deadline's Virtual Sundance Studio. Today, we're talking about Flea with writer-director Jonas Poyer Rasmussen. Welcome, Jonas. Thank you so much Thanks. for being here. It's a pleasure. Uh, it's, this is a really remarkable film. Can you tell us a little bit first just about the genesis of it? You know, what inspired you to make this? And, and just tell us a little bit about this story. Well, basically, it's, it's a story about a, a friend of mine, and he arrived to my sleepy hometown when I was 15, and he arrived all by himself from Afghanistan. Um, and then we kind of met up at the bus stop every morning going to high school, and we slowly became very good friends. Um, and that's 25 years ago now. And in all these years, he never told me or anyone else about how or why he got to Denmark from Afghanistan. Um, I, and I kind of knew that there was a story somewhere, but he didn't really want to talk about it. Um, uh, and I've done a lot of radio documentaries before. So like 10 years ago, I started asking him if I could do his story as a radio documentary. And he was saying no, but he wasn't ready yet. Um, and then I was approached by this place called the Animation Workshop here in Denmark. And they wanted to ask me if I had an idea for an animated documentary. Um, and then his story popped up again, and I asked him again, and he finally said yes. Um, also because the animation kind of enables us to uh, make him anonymous, as he didn't want to kind of share his law, like his life trauma um, uh, as a public person. Mm -hmm. uh, like you said, there is a, a clear reason for the use of animation here, but um, could you talk about sort of the through line in your films today? Because it seems like you often mix mediums, whether that's documentary and fiction or documentary and animation. It's rare to see uh, that kind of combination in a film. Um, so, um, well, it, the animation is, is it's really because this is a film that like the story takes place in the past, first of all. So it's kind of like, how do you show Afghanistan in the 80s? How do you show Moscow in the 90s? And also, because this is seen through the kids of a, of the, seen through the eyes of a kid. Uh, so how do you see like a war? And how do you show traumatic events? Uh, and here animation really helped us to be expressive and more emotional than we could with the uh, live action. And then we use a, a lot of archive in the film as well to kind of tie this animation to the like real historical events. So you're always kind of reminded that this is a true story. This is, this is not a fiction. This is, this is a real person who's telling his story uh, for the first time. Mm -hmm. and, and could you elaborate a bit on the, the kind of um, aesthetics we have in animation and the way you tap into uh, your friend known as Amin in the film, his state of mind throughout? Yes, I used a special way of interviewing where he's kind of laying down with his eyes closed. And that's something I used when doing radio documentaries before. And then I asked him to talk in present tense. Uh, and then I asked him to just kind of describe everything around him. Uh, and this, we really use this for the animation. So what you see is kind of what he described to me, what, like when he told me his story for the first time. Um, and then we have this we have two different kinds of animation. One is kind of realistic to the animation where we did a, lot, did a lot of research on how things really looked like in Afghanistan and how things looked like in Denmark in the 90s or in, in Russia in the 80s. Um, and then there's this more graphic or expressive layer, which is when uh, he experiences something traumatic uh, and then it gets really gritty and rough uh, and a lot more surreal. Um, so that's when he experienced something traumatic or if there's things he has a hard time remembering. Um, so th these are the two different kinds of animation we, we use in the film. Mm -hmm. And like we've noted, uh, Amin, he's a longtime friend of yours, but still this story, as we see in the film, is incredibly traumatic to him. It's something he's never been able to tell anybody for, I guess, multiple reasons. What is the process in the, I, I know you interviewed him, it seemed like over the course of years. What is the process of, of maintaining trust and also maintaining a sense of comfort for him throughout. I mean, um, as he goes about relaying all of this to you. We started out having like a three day session where he kind of told me this, the, like the broad strokes of his story. Um, and at that point he said that there was things he still wasn't ready to, to talk about. And I made it totally clear for him that he like, we just had to do it at his own pace. Um, but he knew that this was something he had to do. Like he'd been living with this, this past 
that he couldn't tell anyone about, and that made his past and present disconnected. So he felt like he couldn't really bring his past into where he was today. Um, so he knew this was something he had to do. Um, and then when we had this three-day session, that was kind of where everything started. And then we had, I don't know, like I think we had like 12 interviews afterwards where we kind of dug deeper and deeper into his story. Where where did you you find this interview technique of having someone lie on that floor with their eyes closed? It's almost a therapeutic thing. It's kind of fascinating. But it's actually, actually from a time doing radio uh, because there you, you don't have images, uh, so you have you you need to have your uh, uh, the person you're interviewing be very precise in what it is they see, um, and this kind of makes everything come alive again. And for him also because he was talking about his past. This thing about trying to make his past come alive again um, was crucial to kind of make the, to be able to make the animation and make it feel uh, vivid. Mm -hmm. Well, as Amin's friend, what did you feel? What was going through your, your body and your mind when you were hearing the, all these details come out that you had never heard before? Um, but it, in this situation, I was more just focused on him, how he was feeling. And then it wasn't actually that until afterwards when I was working with the material that I kind of realized, whoa, this is, this is a, a crazy story. And also what I kind of, I remember at some point I was working, there's this sequence where he and his brother play volleyball in the film. Um, and I was working on that one. Uh, and I, I kind of realized, oh, but our stories are kind of similar. Um, like we listened to the same music, we saw the same movies, uh, we're the same age. He enjoyed playing volleyball, I enjoyed playing soccer back in my hometown. Um, but then in this sequence, in the volleyball sequence, you have soldiers chasing him through the streets of Kabul, him and his brother, because they want to send his brother to the, to the army and go, go to war. Uh, and that's where just all of a sudden, like his life just took a drastic turn compared to my life all of a sudden. And then he has like five years of fleeing before he arrived to my town. And so he, when he arrived to my town and I'd just been playing soccer in my own town, when he arrived, he had this crazy story that he brought with him. Um, but it wasn't until I actually sat down and really listened to the material that I realized, whoa, okay, this is, this life is so much different than mine. Could you tell us a bit about Amin's, like what you perceived of his feelings when he saw this film come to fruition? Um, it was a long process for him. Um, and he's been like, we've been very, like, he's been very collaborative throughout. Um, of course, he, we did all the interviews. And then on the basis of the interviews, um, I wrote a script and he was a part of writing the script. So we went back and forth just to make sure that he felt that he felt recognized in the script. And then the same thing with editing. So I think it kind of slowly dawned on him that this was becoming a film. So it wasn't like, okay, now the film is there. It was like slowly kind of it was slowly coming um but um it he, he told me that it, it, it he feels liberated now that he finally told the story and now he can kind of like his past is with him now he doesn't need to be afraid of saying something that he shouldn't because now it's all out there mm -hmm. um so for him it's really been a liberating process incredible um well this is a, a really extraordinary film thank you so much Jonas, for being here with us and everyone, uh, thank you for tuning in. Please check out this film at Sundance today at 7 p.m. Pacific. Thank you very much. Thanks.